Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Kellen Betts, a course lead in the MITx MicroMasters and SCM program here at MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. I'm co-hosting today's live event with my colleague, uh, Laura Alega, also a course lead in the MicroMasters program. And today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Sergio Capiero with us, a senior data scientist at Amazon. Welcome, Sergio. Hi, Kellen. Hi, Laura. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to uh, participate in live events and be in touch with the MicroMaster community. Awesome. We're very fortunate to have you. Um, so before we kick things off, we wanted to kick the event off with a poll. For those of you who've been to our events before, you know, we like to start things off with a poll. And so if we could launch our first poll here. Awesome. And so we want to learn a little bit more about our audience today. Why are you here today? Um, a few options here. I'll just go through a couple of them. I want to learn about supply chain data and analytics in general. I'm interested in knowing more about data preparation processes and strategies. I want to know more about using data um, for machine learning. There's lots of interesting topics. Hopefully, we'll cover many of these, but we want to give you a chance there for a few um, a minute or so to, to fill out that poll. And while I do, I'll pass it to my colleague, Laura, who will um, go through a brief agenda for today's session. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome, Sergio, and welcome everyone in the audience. Um, during the next 15 minutes, Sergio will talk about the importance of data preparation to train accurate machine learning models. We will also discuss about the challenges typically encountered when preparing data, and then we will share some best practices that may help you. Kelly and I will then ask a bunch of questions we have prepared for him, and we will save the time at the very end for your questions. Uh, please make sure you use the webinar Q&A feature to ask the questions and be sure to be logged with a name because we will not read any anonymous questions. Uh, so just be ready to participate. We want to make this a very interactive event. And with that, I guess it's good timing for going to the poll results. Uh, so it seems, Sergio, that most people here want to learn about supply chain data and analytics. Um, and uh, learning about data preparation. So I think we are ready to kick it off with you and that probably you will address all of this. So hopefully the audience will be very happy to be here today. Okay, so let's get the, and the party started. Awesome. So let me share my, my screen. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. So the main uh, topic of today is going to be about uh, data preparation for supply chain analytics, with particular focus on how uh, we can be be ready uh, for uh, machine learning. So in the last uh, dec decades, we we've seen how uh, machine learning has expanded to the consumer industry. So basically, uh, many of the products that we buy and the services that we use somehow embed some kind of a machine learning algorithm. And this trend will continue to accelerate in the, in the future. So for instance, so uh, machine learning is embedded in these um, voice uh, control devices that can play uh, music or read the news, or we can just use them to order uh, online, uh, online uh, groceries by talking them from anywhere from, from our, our houses. So every time that we, we uh, use Google and start typing a search, a search term and Google recommends uh, possible uh, search terms, that's also a machine learning in, in action. Online retailers such as Amazon and also using or collecting our data, our preference and also buying habits in order to tailor their um, shopping experience to, uh, to our uh, needs. And similar uh, machine learning algorithms are used every time that we uh, watch a movie and uh, or uh, listen to music in these online streaming services. So, so for instance, we can uh, for for instance uh, the music streaming services are collecting our listening habits. So basically, the the music that we that we listen to and also our preference in order to suggest new mu music or new songs that we might uh, like to to hear as, as well. Also, uh, we've seen the application of machine learning in, in, in services uh, such as uh, banking as well. So every time, for example, that 
there's an unusual large transaction happening in our uh, bank accounts. So typically we receive a, an alert a message through a, through a text, alerting about this, um, this uh, uncommon, uncommon beha behavior. And also in, in transportation, all the navigation services such as Google, Google Maps. So every time that we are looking for the quickest uh, path or the nearest uh, path, to, to a location, also transit time should be estimated. And these transit time estimation are mainly based on uh, machine uh, learning uh, models. So one of the key uh, contributor factors to seeing this uh, expansion of uh, machine learning in the consumer industry, of course, is the data, the data pro proliferation. And this is reflected in the amount of uh, digital data that is being uh, produced. So basically, on a daily basis, roughly 2.5 quinti, quinti billion bytes uh, of data is being generated. So 90% uh, of the world's data has been produced over the last uh, two years. So this means that every two years, the amount of uh, digital information that is, is out there is being, uh, is being uh, doubled. And of course, uh, uh, supply chain chains are also uh, generating massive amounts of, of, of data. So for example, Amazon sells uh, roughly 400, 480 million uh, of unique items to close to a quarter of, of a billion uh, customers. So Walmart uh, handles more than uh, 1 million co co uh, customer transactions on every single single hour. And uh, on a daily basis, UPAs deliver more than 20 billion packages to roughly uh, 8.4 8 uh, million delivery points. And you can imagine that these companies are generating vast amount of information, right? And it's information not only about the product itself, so different characteristics of the product that are being sold and delivered, but also information about the, the customers. So basically what are the preference, what are they searching for, what are they buying, and also information related to uh, supply chains, right? Information about what are the transportation legs that these are delivery using, what are uh, how the, the road routes and a stop look like, transit time, et cetera, et cetera. So behind all of this, a massive number we can see that there's also massive information that is uh, that is that is uh, that is there. But it's not only it's not only volume. So so uh, in these figures, we, we observe that uh, supply chains or large supply chains are generating massive amount of information, but it's also uh, the speed and the variety at which uh, the, the data is being uh, generated. So, so uh, basically on, on every single second, um, supply chains are generating different types of, of information and also the, the type of information that being generated is it's much uh, broader broader now. But what is uh, what is uh, machine learning? So basically, uh, machine learning it's uh, it's uh, so disruptive because it offers a di fundamentally different different approach to uh, program uh, computers. So the traditional traditional approach to teach, for instance, a computer a new task is a uh, focus on um, codifying existing knowledge. So basically, what what we try to do with the traditional approach is try to reflect what is the knowledge of the programmer and trying to translate that knowledge into a different lines of, of code. So basically we're abstracting a task based on the knowledge of the programmer and we are writing a few lines of code to execute the, the task so that the machine or the computer will follow these lines and, uh, and, and, and perform the task. But basically what we are doing here is trying to reflect the knowledge, our knowledge into a few uh, lines of code. And of course, um, this uh, has the main uh, weakness and that weakness is related to what is known as Polanyi's uh, paradox. So basically uh, this paradox says that uh, we know more than we can, we can tell. So meaning that, so our knowledge is so extensive that we might know how a certain task works but it is difficult or uh, sometimes impossible to translate this into into a word into words. For example, how can you uh, tell a computer uh, uh, how can uh, the, the machine or the computer recognize a cat cat face? So it will be almost impossible to write a code in order to uh, for in order to uh, perform that identification or visual 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 tags. Of if it is possible, we do require. Um, 
thousands of lines, lines of code. So this is where the machine learning comes into, into play. So basically machine learning offers a different, uh, offers a, a paradigm a shift. In this case, uh, machine learning involves uh, programming computers in a different way. So basically we are asking the machine to learn from the from data and from past past experience. So this approach will be similar to the approach that we use uh, uh, with our quit, for example. So if I want to my, 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 my child uh, to recognize a cat, to learn why, what's the cat, I will show a cat in different contexts. So every time that I, I see a cat, I will, I, will, I, will, I will tell him, so this is a cat and see he will or she will, um, she will uh, understand what is uh, the meaning of a cat in different uh, contexts and will be able to recognize. So this is a similar approach in, 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 the, say, in, in the sense that we're going to be offering to the machine, to the computers, so different examples, and we'll tag them as cats or different animals in such a way that, they, that based on this experience, based on this exposure to different images, so at the end, the machine will be able to uh, recognize uh, the, the, the object that it's trying to, it's trying to, um, it's trying to, uh, to get. Okay, so let's see how how this uh, or the, the machine learning uh, process uh, end to end uh, works. So basically, everything has started uh, with some question that we want to to answer, right? So we have a business problem problem that we are trying to solve, and based on the, this business pro problem, we start a data collection. So at the beginning, so this data collection is basically collecting historical information, so that is a uh, uh, information or data that we have accumulated uh, over time. So, and of course, these data will come in different from multiple sources and might come in different and format. So we might be receiving uh, information or data in, in numeric, so coming from, from tables, but also might, might get information, for example, that are coming from, from uh, as, as text or even images. So the next step will be, okay, so we need to um, somehow, we need to um, prepare the data. As you can imagine, so the, the machine learning algorithm will require that the data is in specific format. So for example, we need to provide the machine learning uh, algorithms with a numeric data. So somehow we need to translate all of the information that are coming from different sources formats into a, a single a single format. And this is typically what we do during uh, data preparation. So we prepare the, the data in order to, get, to be ready for a, a further analysis. And so based on the historical data, after we clean it, after we prepare, we will get a training data. So these training data are gonna be the examples that I were referring to. This is gonna be the images of cats or similar information that gonna be feeding the machine learning in order for them to be, to be trained. And this is uh, when the training happens. So we offer these examples. So we offer these samples to the computers and there's gonna be happening, a, there's, there's gonna be a training uh, happening. So at the end, after the machine uh, learns to recognize the cat, for example, so it will come up with a model. So basically the model is gonna be just saying, okay, if I get an image, I would recognize if it's a cat or, or not. So basically it's gonna be just a, a translation. So this is only one, one piece of, of the equation, of course. So at the end, so we start uh, asking about uh, or trying to solve a problem and we ended uh, with, a, with a model. But of course, this is not the, the final, final goal. goal. So we have a data set with uh, with uh, images of cats for for instances for instance, but we don't we we know that or we know already that that information. So uh, we know the training set. So basically, what we want the machine to do is to recognize new objects. So basically, offer the machine new objects and see if the machine if the machine is able to recognize the object that is in the in the picture, for example. So that's why. There's also another stream of data that we need to co collect. So basically, this is the live or ongoing data uh, of going uh, data stream. So again, so this is coming from the from the similar sources and is coming from a um, different uh, the format as well. But but uh, the main difference with the historical data basically that is that we are we are using we're gathering this information uh, live. And as before, this data also should be uh, harmonized and aggregated. So basically it's gonna be following the, exactly the same uh, pro processing steps that we that we did for our historical data. And at the end, so then we're gonna be using the model that was trained. I'm gonna be using this model with the new information that we have. 
basic program using the model with this uh, new ongoing data. And at the end, we care about the, the outputs. So we're going to be making the prediction on, on the new, new data. So it's, uh, as you can see, so data preparation is not only key uh, before training the data, but it's also very important to uh, pro process our data only also when we are receiving this uh, live data because at the, at the end we mainly care about the output we mainly care about uh, um, using the computer or the machine in order to reconnect recognize new objects that are not only uh, in historical historical data as you can see so in what what we basically are doing in in the, in the model is um is uh, is a prediction. So basically, in this case, prediction will imply taking information of one kind and getting information of another kind. Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're providing, for instance, the object to the machine, okay, uh, or the, uh, a picture which contain an object and the machine or the computer will tell us what is the object that is containing the, the image. So basically, we are getting this prediction. And the prediction could be just interpret as a, a simple a, a to b a to b mapping so basically the model is going to be taking some inputs so that will be the a and then it's going to be a based on the train model based on that information that a, a, on the training data is going to be getting a response a b so this is just an a to b to b mapping so we are converting information that we know so the image the, the pixels on the image and based on this information we're going to get in information that we don't don't know but we care about and it will in this case will be the the object that is in the image and we can uh, we can we can mention a different example for 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 this so for example every time that we get an email so gmail for example need to decide if the email is a span or not so basically based on different characteristics of the of the emails based on the train set when I be saying if the current current email that we are getting is classified or is flagged as as a spam or not, uh, I mentioned the example of the of the image and the and the object. A similar a, a similar um, a use case would be every time that we're gonna be uh, translating for or we're gonna be uh, transcribing from an audio clip. So the audio clip is gonna be the input. And then we're going to use in model in order to get the task. So basically transcribing the audio clip into, into a text or the, or the other way around. So every time that we have a text and we ask, for example, word to read that, 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 that text. And finally, in translation services as well. So every time that we're going to be translating, for, for instance, from English to, to French, this is exactly the, what is, what is happening. And in supply chains, we are typically, we, we typically asso associate prediction with the, with the future. So we make, so we look at historical information in order to make a forecast that will imply some behavior of the future. However, as you can see in, in all of these examples, so the, the term prediction in machine learning uh, has a broader meaning. So meaning that um, a prediction could be, of course, could be used to predict something in the future or to forecast something in the future but also we can use this prediction for real time or even or even the past for example every time that we get an email so gmail should make a decision a, a live decision in order to 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 determine if the, if the email is a span or not so we're not forecasting about the future we're forecasting about the, the, the present we're making a prediction about the, the, the present and same thing happen every time that we have a, an initial transaction in, in banking for for, in, for instance another a key characteristic of the machine learning algorithms is the also the that they provide more accurate predictions compared to traditional uh, traditional statistical uh, methods, and this can be uh, can be uh, better understood uh, with these uh, with these graphics. So in this graphic, what we're trying to reflect is the performance of the algorithm algorithm or the prediction. So you can say, for example, how accurate is the machine able to recognize cats versus the amount of data that we feed. So basically based on the number of images or pictures that are going to be provided to the machine uh, to train. So the beginning, or if we use traditional machine learning, so this will be the typical behavior of the of the performance. So we start feeding with more and more data and we can see that there is a, 
a rapid increase on the, in, the, in the performance of the algorithm, right? There's a rapid increase in the accuracy of the algorithm. But at some point, so it reached a threshold and basically regardless if we feed with more and more data, so the accuracy is gonna be, is gonna be basically the same. But what happened if we move to a more advanced machine learning? So what's happening if, for example, we use a, a very small a neural network, if we use a deep learning? As we can see, again, we have a very gain, a very rapid increase in, in accuracy in performance. And we can feed more and more data, and we can see that there is a slightly increase in, in the performance. And this increase can be even more drastic when we have a large uh, neural network. So basically when we have millions of millions of uh, neural, uh, neural, ne ne neurons, we can expect a similar uh, performance. Of course, there's a, theor a theoretical uh, maximum of the, of the accuracy and performance. But the main point here is if we can use these very advanced uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, so basically the performance or the accuracy that we can we can achieve is uh, it's much higher. And of course, this implies using more and more uh, data. As I, as I was mentioned, uh, machine learning uh, requires data to be in a specific uh, format. So most of the machine learning will require all the inputs to be as, as numeric. So of course we can use a machine learning uh, to, uh, to image or text, but somehow we need to process that, info, that, that data in order to convert in the proper format to the machine learning to, to, uh, uh, to use. And of course, this will require some, some, some preparation uh, in, in the data. As you can imagine, regardless if we have the perfect model, so the garbage in, gar garbage out applies here. So regardless if you have a perfect model, if we are feeding the model with uh, information or data that is not, um, is not of good quality, of not precise, of course, the prediction that we are getting is going to be also useless or going to be uh, misleading. So it's very important for the machine learning algorithms to have a uh, quality, quality input. And usually when we talk about the data preparation, what we are referring to is mainly uh, getting all the data ready for, uh, for, uh, for further analysis. And typically, uh, uh, data preparation involves uh, two tasks. On one end, we have data preprocessing. And on the other, we have data in general. And let's and let's me, me talk about uh, more in detail about, about this. So when we uh, refer to data processing, basically we're using about a specific tasks that we need to do on the data. For example, we need to clean the data. Somehow we need to um, uh, replace, uh, for instance, some um, erroneous values. We need to input uh, missing information. Uh, we might need uh, to, or we, we will need to partition, for example, the database and those uh, similar strategies. The first one is, of course, uh, uh, cleaning the data. And when doing the clean, cleaning the data, there are two main activities that we uh, have to look for. So the first one is remove, removing outliers. So basically, we're going to be looking for or identifying these atypical, uh, very high or very low, low, low values. And usually we need to define what is the better strategy for us uh, based on the context of analysis to deal with this with an, uh, with these uh, outliers. The second thing is about um, duplicates. So basically, if we if we have duplicate information, we also we might need uh, to remove this 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 information. But also, data cleaning includes. Um, additional uh, tasks. So for instance, replacing uh, missing data, uh, inaccurate data or even uh, correcting missing, missing values. So we might use some imputation technique uh, techniques uh, here. Also, uh, as part of this uh, data preposing, so we need to partition the, the data. So uh, typically uh, we will divide our data set in three different data sets. So we'll get a training a validation and also a test uh, set. So as the name says, the training, the training data set is gonna be used to train our models. So the validation set is gonna be used in order to uh, tune the different parameters that, that the model ma might need. And finally, the test of the mod, the, the test data is gonna be used to evaluate, to evaluate the performance, for example, the accuracy of the, of the, of the, of the model. And of course, we will need to somehow randomly uh, create or divide our original data set in this uh, through uh, three uh, subsets. 
also uh, a scale uh, it's important also that um, all the features all of all the columns all the variables that we're using in the model are in a similar scales a scale in order to make sure that they uh, all uh, features are equally important and this is a uh, particularly uh, true for specific uh, machine learning algorithms which uh, calculate distances between between uh, between uh, futures so there are uh, here are two, two strategies that can be followed so we can uh, normalize the, the data or we can normalize the future basically meaning that uh, translating or transforming uh, our data into a zero one one scale so basically all the values for the new columns gonna be contained be between this range between zero or one and the second option is to uh, standardize the, the data so basically all the data is going to be uh, having is going to be centered into to a mean uh, which is going to be zero and will have a standard deviation of 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 of, uh, of one and finally, uh, we can also explore uh, data augmentation. So basically, it will be the strategy um, to artificially uh, create data uh, from from existing data. And um, this is quite useful, especially when we have a, a small a small data set. So basically, going to be just uh, creating new new data or synthetic new data based on the current uh, historical information that we that we have. Regarding uh, feature engineering. Also, uh, so so in this part, basically, what we are trying to do is to identify what are the best features are going to be uh, feeding into the into the into the model. So in the previous step, what we did just we clean the data, we divide it in in three in, in different in different uh, sets, and we generate more data if if need, if it needs. But now it's time to focus on okay, what are going to be the variables that are going to be used in the model, and of course. There is a lot of um, uh, there is a lot of uh, visualization that can help can help here. Here we are trying to identify what would be the more meaningful uh, minimal mini meaningful features or, or variables that are going to be using in the model. So it's a good way to identify this will be through different and different analysis, correlation analysis, or dif different different uh, different graphs. But also there are a specific a specific tasks that I can perform during feature engineering. And one is a feature selection. And basically this is going to be just the process of trying to identify what are the best the best features of the of the model and this can be achieved uh, through or getting an an important score so basically telling 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 me or doing a preliminary analysis in order to identify what will be the more important features but also we can run for example correlation analysis in order to see what will be the best uh, choices to to make but basically here what we are doing is just filtering what are the the, the most important features to be included in, in the model we might also uh, require to, to transform somehow the, the data. So uh, this task just implies uh, modifying the data, but but keeping the, the same information. So for instance, we can uh, somehow um, make some some um, some transformation in our data. Uh, we might, for example, take the, the logarithm of a, of a specific, uh, specific uh, variable, or we might uh, need to use Cartesian product, for example, when we believe there, that may be a correlation between categorical categorical values. So basically, we are just playing with the data and coming up with different uh, additional, additional features. And similar thing happened with feature, feature creation. So in this, uh, so so here our feature creation basically involves a creating new data from existing data. So for instance, uh, every time that we're going to use one code encoding, so when we translate a categorical var variables into a um, dummy variables, so we are creating a new a new feature based on, on, on one uh, one whole encoding or every time for example that we calculate new futures based on the current variables that we have every time uh, that we do that we are creating a new future and finally feature uh, extraction so this will be case is uh, particularly in which uh, we have a very large uh, data set and not talking about the, the examples or samples that we had but regarding the features that we that we would have and in that case, it might be a good idea to reduce the amount, the amount of data being processed, especially uh, especially to uh, consume uh, uh, less uh, com computational resources and have a, a, a model that uh, runs uh, faster. And of course, here there are a lot, uh, there are a bunch of methods that can 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 be used. For example, we can use a PCI, 
uh, which will allow us to reduce the dimensionality of our data set. So basically, we're going to be just reducing the number of calls that, that we're going to be uh, using. And with that, uh, so let me stop here and let uh, open to questions that you might have. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sergio. Great, uh, fascinating presentation. Really highlights the ro central role that um, data preparation really plays in the process um, and how it fits into that pipeline and where we can start to then utilize some of these advanced techniques or these, some of these kind of transformational techniques like machine learning. And maybe before we start diving into some specific uh, questions on data and machine learning, and I also see that there's a bunch of questions there in the Q&A, so that's awesome. Keep it up. Um, please jump in there with your questions if you have them. We'll keep an eye on that Q&A feature. Um, but before kind of diving into some specific questions about data and machine learning, I wanted to start out with maybe a, a broad question on your experience and what you see the role for data and supply chain, maybe supply chain strategies, supply chain design, supply chain operations. You know, what role does data and machine learning play in these different functions? Okay, so so data is very is very important for the definition of the supply chain strategy, but also it's very important to streamline uh, operations. Uh, and also data is very important for the, for instance to come up with new uh, products and services and also to uh, to improve the, the the user or consumer ex experience so uh, uh, by collecting data so what we can do or what, what we can achieve so basically is uh, to improve our operations because at the end so that the data will become in metrics and based on these metrics we can improve uh, the operations so this is one 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 uh, use that we can do, uh, do that we can we can do in our data so basically to improve our operations but also include uh, uh, data can allow us to uh, imp improve uh, transparency and, and visibility for example if you relate to uh, to deliveries to shipment so we can track every single moment where my shipment shipment is so we can use data in order to uh, en enhance the visibility that we have on our data and of course uh, data is just data and unless we can uh, further analyze so and that is where the importance of data analytics come into into play so data analytics or supply chain analytics so basically will allow us to um, to analyze, to process the data in order to improve this decision making. So at the end, the main goal of the data analytics and data should be should be support uh, the decision making in all the aspects and in all the function of uh, supply chains. Thank you, Sergio, for bringing that. I love connecting data to visibility because that, you know, it's very important to us and we always work on this end-to-end -end vision. Uh, so that's a great insight. And I wanted also to bring it to like down to earth uh, task we do when we are working in supply chain. We also have a lot of questions on this from the audience. So it's great that we bring it right here, right now. Uh, we would love to hear about the importance of a role of data, for example, in topics like network design models, when we are defining optimum location for a new facility, or we're trying to think on what's the best physical flow for our products at a certain point of time. Uh, we would love to know how may data collection and preparation be different when we are approaching different type of supply chain pro problems and if there is any challenge you foresee that you would like to share with us. Uh, sure. Uh, um, optimization models and in particular the net network design models are also um, uh, data intensive. So we need to uh, collect or we need to uh, forecast uh, demand data, for example, we need somehow to estimate uh, distances or transit times in order to fit uh, this model. So we, we need uh, data collection and data preparation also for these uh, models. So however, the main difference that I identify is, is basically on the level of intensity that we need in this in the task. As, as, I, as I mentioned, so machine learning really needs a lot of data. So data collection and data preparation are usually a very resource and time consuming, consuming task. And usually in optimization models, at least in those that are strategic decisions, so every time, for example, not going to be designing the network or a facility location problem, so this is not, this is not going to be a decision that we're going to be doing on a, on a monthly basis. So usually the, the time span 
is going to be evolving at least a few a few years. So basically, that means that the data collection and data, data preparation is going to be one single one single effort, and that effort not going to be repeated in the next five five for for five or four four years. However, in the case for machine learning. So uh, we might have one-time effort to collect the training data, but as I, as I mentioned, we I mentioned we also need to collect la, live data. So basically, uh, the effort to record that data is going to be on a daily basis. On a daily basis, we should be collecting the new data. We should be uh, cleaning the new data, and that data is going to be feeding the, the, the model in order to get the predictions that we that we want. So the main difference, I would say, is the level of uh, intensity that these two stars are going to be uh, consuming. Awesome, thank you. That's a that's a great insight. Um, so I want to pull in a couple of questions here, maybe to kind of tie in a couple of questions that I see in the Q and A. Also, with one that we had kind of prepared on just this process of uh, you know cleaning data, but then just the concept of cleaning data in the first place. You know, if you think about it, you know, if we didn't, if we had perfect data to begin with, you know, you maybe you have your perfect model, but if you had perfect data to begin with, we wouldn't need to clean it in the first place, maybe, or or maybe we would have to fewer or different types of data transformation or data processing. Um, needs. And so then maybe the question goes to, and this also goes to, ties into a question by Rishi um, on, you know, what is really this, maybe some of the sources or what's been your experience on some of the sources, some of those data quality issues upstream, you know, um, you know, is it all the way upstream to like the point of capture with the sensors or is it the systems or is it the databases that the data is stored in? Like what are some of the, the, I guess, maybe weaknesses within that data pipeline, um, and then how, what are the, some of the processes that you can then utilize to try to, you know, account for some of those issues for the, some of those quality issues you notice upstream? Got it. Yeah. So, so two, two things here. So on one end, so data quality uh, might be, might be an issue. And uh, basically uh, data, data quality mainly, is mainly, mainly uh, coming from issues that we may have during uh, data capture, right? So uh, we may have, uh, different levels of accuracy in our uh, machining systems. That's one source of uh, of um, of um, of um, uh, error. But also, uh, so it's related to the precision of the instrument that we are using. But also, it's uh, maybe the the instruments are not uh, very well calibrated. Right? So there are some uh, machining issues that we we might we may have precision related or maybe just a calibration calibration issue. But also keep in mind that there's a, a, a still a still uh, 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 an important uh, important size of the data that is being collected uh, manually. So basically, companies still using some manual inputs uh, to feed to feed the, their systems. And of course, these uh, manual systems or uh, uh, human intensive processes are uh, uh, prone to prone to error. So that's a uh, one one thing. So uh, issues related to quality quality. So mainly com coming from the data ca capturing end piece. However, even though we have the perfect data in terms of quality, so we might need also some uh, press prep uh, processing as well in in the data. Uh, because the data uh, that we we might need for a particular model uh, uh, almost for sure will be coming from different different sources and these uh, different sources might be providing the data in different uh, levels of granularity so we'll need some some data to be aggregated some uh, data to be deaggregated and we need to put it in the right in the, in the right for, format format uh, as well so uh, so somehow the data preparation uh, is going to be uh, required for, for for our models. Thank you, Sergio. And I want to switch gears to talk about tools specifically because we have a lot of questions about tools, and we were also wondering what's your approach or your recommendation. Actually, is uh, I would say that it, it it depends on the on the use use case. So for instance, if we are a supply chain manager, right? So, so we we mainly care about the the business, and we might be running some some analysis or getting some machine learning models on a few times in a, in a year, right? So maybe three, four times a, a year. So a specific use case, specific analysis that we that we need to to do to do. It's not going to be, of course, an in-depth analysis. It's going to be just some exploration and trying to uh, come up with an an hypothesis about the the bits. In that situation, for example, we can use many of the um, plug and play tools that we have out there. So, for example, Orange. Orange. 
So it's not uh, really, it doesn't require uh, any specific coding, coding skills. So we just plug and play, identify or create a few, few charts in orange, identify what might be the relevant uh, relevant relations. And based on that, we just plug in and play, we can uh, train a few, a, a few models. So that will be the best, uh, the best uh, time uh, investment, for example, for, uh, for this time of users. But of course, if you are a data a supply data analyst and you're gonna be uh, running this model uh, more, more times a year. So somehow you will need to go uh, to these uh, tools that would require some some coding skills, and Ari, for example, is is is, is an option here, or Python, Python as well, right? And if, but this is but again, so this is like uh, the the intermediate uh, user, and going to be running this analysis on a frequently frequent basis. But at the end, the analysis is going to be used to make recommendation or to inform uh, decisions. But base, but but. Uh, your your models are gonna be models are gonna be implemented not gonna be implemented in uh, company in company systems right it's only to to inform the inform decisions however if uh, the use cases might be different right so we may have for example as in the example that I was show, showing right so recommendation uh, services uh, Spotify for instance right to suggest new 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 uh, new songs that you might might like. In those situations, there is a machine learning model that is uh, that is in in the in the company systems. So there are some recommendation system system there, and if that's use case, of course, not going to be using uh, these plug and play tools. We're going to use an uh, just uh, Python or uh, R. In those situations, you you have to use system that systems that uh, will allow you to scale uh, your operations, a scale in terms of the data that are going to be using, but also in the computational power that you will you will need. In those situations, so the only the, the cloud tools uh, are going to be your uh, best best options. Awesome, thank you. The, um, definitely a diversity of tools out there and it makes sense to kind of contextualize them based on the use case. Um, makes a lot of sense. So I know I'm keeping an eye on time here. I know we're gonna get close to the time here. And so if we could maybe launch our second poll here while we close things out. And I think we maybe have time for maybe one more question there, Laura. Um, and I see one here that looks interesting from um, Alton Edis. And I apologize, I'm not pronouncing your, your name wrong, but um, Alton Edis. This question I think is, is an interesting one. Um, how do neural networks, how are neural networks built and what infrastructure is used? You know, kind of how, how do you actually build and run a, a neural network machine learning model? I think that sounds like a fantastic thing because you mentioned those as some being some of the more accurate um, types of models um, in your presentation. So, yeah, also you, you can also uh, run. So there are specific libraries, Python libraries, for, for instance, that you can use uh, to build a small and uh, also a large uh, neural networks. So the main 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 difference compared to traditional methods is of course the accuracy that I, I mentioned that you can achieve with models, but also uh, you can get rid of part of the data preparation. So basically all related to feature engineering. So in order to select what are gonna be the, the ideals, the ideal uh, features to include in, in your analysis or in your model. So all of these tasks can be taken care of the, of the neural network. So basically, you just ignore that piece. You ignore a feature feature engineering. You just feed your neural network with all with all the features that uh, you have, and then the the model itself will identify what are the the most relevant the relevant uh, features. Thank you, Sergio. I hope you hear me well now. Um, I want to bring one last question before we go to the poll results. Michael and Lucas are bringing small and medium-sized businesses. How does it work for this kind of businesses to improve data gathering and uh, preparation and the use of data and the implementation of machine learning, how possible and feasible it is when we're talking about small businesses? Yeah, in, 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 for, for small uh, businesses, I think it's it's critical first to identify what will be the machine learning machine learning need. So basically, what's the, the the use case? What's the problem that they are, they are trying to to solve? Uh, once they identify, okay, what's the the problem that they're trying to solve? Then the next question will be if so, machine learning could be a, a solution to that. 
right? So as I was explaining, so machine learning uh, offers a, a way to uh, to to to, um, to come up with with predictions. So the main usage for machine learning will be to 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 these uh, predictions. So if machine learning is it's it's it's, a, it's an option. So the next question will be about data collections, data collections, because especially for small businesses. So we cannot just collect as much data as we need because data collection is also uh, coming uh, with, the, with the cost. So in that case, we have to focus on the data that uh, we at least we uh, believe is gonna be relevant for, for analysis and just collecting the, the data that we need uh, is gonna be critical for, for that. And then uh, we can uh, use some, um, uh, some tools uh, online uh, for all the data processing and also for, to come up for a model. So there are a typical service where you just pay um, a variable cost. So by just using uh, the, or training the model a few, a few, few, few times. In that way, you don't have to invest in infrastructure or uh, additional resources to, uh, to train your, your models. Awesome. Thank you, Sergio. It definitely makes sense. The difference between a company, you know, you mentioned you know, Walmart and Amazon, those examples where Walmart's processing like a million transactions per hour, which is kind of like mind boggling scale versus a small business, which might have a few customers an hour, you know, definitely a difference in scale and so different approaches and different volume of data to manage. Um, so maybe if we could share, take a look at that poll really quickly here, and then we'll wrap up our live event. So the poll, the question was, you know, what was the most interesting part of today's session for you? And it looks like um, the most most common answer was expanding my knowledge of data and analytics. I'm learning about the data preparation process. I'm learning about specific applications of data and ML and supply chain. So that's great. We're, we're glad you found those topics interesting. I know we you know, there's lots of questions in the Q&A. We always have way more questions that we have time for. Um, but I don't know, Laura or Sergio, I don't know if you have any final comments you'd like to say before we wrap things up here. I would just like to uh, thank Sergio for joining us today and for bringing a lot of great insights to our audience. You have addressed most of the questions we've received before we even got to the Q&A feature part. So that's great. It means like everything we provided was of their interest. So that's amazing. And we would love to see you in the future again. So hopefully we can host you again soon. It's been my, my, my pleasure. So it's uh, as mentioned at the beginning, it's always a pleasure to be in touch with, with CTL and also with the Master community. Th thanks again for having me. Yeah, thank you, Sergio. And thank you, Lara, for co-hosting. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Bye. See Bye -bye. you in the next week.